incredibly astounding biography, academic work. Um, so, uh, Dr. Pamela Hall works in the areas of ethics, theological anthropology, and theology and literature. More specifically, she pursues ways to understand the nature and experience of the self with the help of humanistic work in philosophy, theology, and literature. She is drawn to these questions. How can we understand selfhood as a dynamic process? How does this guide and change our conceptions of the virtues and their work? And what are the richest and most helpful ways to think about these questions? This leads her to consider imagination's role in the moral life and why literature and art more broadly is crucial for reflection on humanity. She has written on Aquinas' ethics in her work Narrative and the Natural Law and Interpretation of Thomistic Ethics, on the virtues according to McIntyre, Murdoch, and Nussbaum, and she is currently drafting a book on saints and the project of selfhood with the help and challenge of novels about saints. Dr. Hall teaches graduate seminars on narrative and female selfhoods, uh, including texts within philosophy, memoir, and the novel, uh, recent virtue ethics, and on theological ethics and the novel. On the undergraduate level, Dr. Hall teaches the courses Literature of the Soul, Literature of Religion, and Ethics, Human Goodness. Dr. Hall received the Emory Williams Award for Distinguished Teaching in the Humanities from Emory University in 1992, and she was awarded the Massey Martin NEH Distinguished Teaching Chair in Emory College for the term of 1998 to 2002. She was Chair of the Department of Women's Studies from 2003 to 2006. She has served on the National Committee on the Status of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People in the Profession of the American Philosophical Association. And without further ado, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, it was very kind of you. I wrote that, so <laughs> you'll know not to believe it. <laughs> uh, welcome to all of you. I uh, wanted just to talk a little bit about the virtues, which I like to think about in relation to the good life and in relation to what we might call flourishing. And in order to do that, uh, I want to set out a little toolkit. And let me just say something about the kind of teaching that I do and what I would like us to engage in tonight. I don't lecture. Uh, I'm a philosopher. We have no facts. We make it up. So I invite us to make it up together. And so please feel free to ask questions or contribute uh, as we go along. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. So with me so far? Okay, great. Uh, everyone's finished eating. Everyone stand up and stretch. Let's get some energy. Yay, we don't have to be passive. Yay. I'm not gonna make you do Tai Chi. That's usually what I <clears throat> tend to do. Thank you. <clears throat> this is, I feel like drawing an arrow and then standing under it, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> that's right. that's right. Thank you all, thank you all. Um, oh, sorry, I've already messed up the filming. I apologize. It's, it's very odd to be filmed, you know. I, it's like I, I usually don't like witnesses, you know. <laughs> that was like so let me start with a little bit of uh, background in thinking about the virtues in relation to the good life. And in order to do that I just want to sketch a tiny piece of Aristotle and then slip in someone even weirder, Simone Weil, and some of her uh, descriptions of what the role of attention is in the moral life. With me so far, here we go. Okay, so Aristotle, ancient Greek philosopher, um, a student of Plato, but didn't agree with Plato about um, a good deal, uh, <laughs> shall we say, as teachers and students will sometimes do wanted to think about the particular way in which human beings can engage in the good life, what he would call eudaimonia, flourishing, right? With me so far? So here, here's the part where the philosopher writes a Greek word on the board and then points to it like it means something. <laughs> this is just a, a kind of plain Greek word that he wants to give a particular kind of more precise meaning to. This is usually translated happiness. Uh, I think it's better translated flourishing and I'll say a little bit about why. This is what he thinks human beings can be ordered to with the help of the virtues which they acquire and I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Uh, but the virtues alone will, my marker's already giving out, uh, uh, are not uh, adequate, sorry, we're just going to have to deal with this. Um, 
Okay, so virtues would be um, capacities or traits of what's sometimes called character, which people can acquire by practice and it, what I call second nature. It can become second nature and it makes them the kinds of people who are able to flourish in a particular way. Okay, so name some virtues. We still have that word in our language. We still use that word. Uh, and Aristotle wants to think a little bit about virtues too. So name, if you would, just can you offer some suggestions about some traits or patterns of acting that we might call virtues even now? Just, yes, please, Elaine. Honesty. Honesty, it's a great one. Yes, absolutely. Uh, not in evidence in my self-introduction. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Yes, honesty would be a great... Uh, yes, please, James. Thankful. Uh, thankfulness? Yes, wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, uh, they're taking freshmen early every year. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that was like a, that's right. You're doing very well. That was it. Oh, that's absolutely. Well done, sir. Okay, yes, please. Patience? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I, I just, it's, I'm old and I have bad hearing. <laughs> that was like, Yes, those are great traits. Uh, yes, please. Oh, Hannah. Kindness. Kindness, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, kindness. Oh, great. This is great. I and mean, then we can just all go home. Yes, please. Compassion. Compassion, wonderful. Loyalty. Compassion and loyalty. That's wonderful. These are excellent. And you can see, and this is pretty much what Aristotle really does in his method. He begins to just work from what you would call popular opinion, some beliefs that people have, and he begins to sort of sort through them to see if we can see connections, to see if we can decide, well, that really connects to something else, or maybe that isn't exactly what we want. And that is pretty much actually philosophical method, that you begin somewhere and then you begin to subject your opinions or your beliefs or whatever arguments you're uh, initiating with in, with uh, some kind of further scrutiny. Uh, does it contradict itself? Do we want to compare it to something else that we've experienced? Uh, and this is very much what uh, Aristotle does as well. Any, any other possibilities? Give me one or two others. Yes, please, Liz. Generosity. Generosity, that's a great one. Y'all are Y'all are very nice people, I can tell. <clears throat> uh, that's absolutely. Um, others, yes, please. Justice. Justice, yes, excellent. Uh, one of those core Greek virtues, for sure. <clears throat> Can't do much without justice uh, in the Greek world. Yes, please. Achievement. Sorry? Achievement. Achievement. That's a great one. Yeah, a kind of ambition. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Excellent. So here's an interesting thing about the virtues for Aristotle, and I think probably this is a true statement that he makes. We don't have them by nature. He says in the ethics, in the Nicomachean ethics from which I'm drawing, he says, we don't have the virtues by nature and they're not contrary to nature, but we have by nature the ability to acquire them. So how do you acquire them? How do we acquire these traits? Any thoughts on that? If I want to be, it's actually harder. <laughs> it's harder than we might think. If I want to be a patient person, if I want to be a kind person, and a person of achievement, a, perf a person of justice, how would I go about doing that? Please. Uh, you can learn by example. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Um, yes, we can learn by example. So you might. That's, you know, that's a really fun and tricky topic, is how we learn to imitate people. What do you imitate? I mean, it actually it's, it takes some sorting out how to do that. But yeah, we could learn by example. Yes, please. Uh, intentional practice. Ah, beautiful, yes. And I think for Aristotle, that's going to be a core one, too. Uh, you, you practice. Uh, it's, you learn to be virtuous. If you pardon me, the same way you learn, say, to play the violin, you begin by playing very badly, right? I mean, any of us who have ever practiced as kids, you have to practice. And there's going to be something essentially uh, inadequate 
about those rehearsals, about those early performances, but there, you gotta start somewhere. An example obviously can illuminate. Uh, another component of uh, acquiring the virtues for Aristotle is experience, which is an interesting claim because there's something for him about the nature of life where we just need enough particular examples, you need enough time under your belt to really get a sense of how to be honest, how to be thankful, how to be patient, how to be compassionate or just, or the great one that he wants to think about too, what he calls practical wisdom, which is a wisdom about how to achieve, hmm, how to achieve the good here and now. Without practical wisdom, you just go bust because you might have you know, self-control or a desire to be kind, but you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to implement it. Right. With me so far? Now an interesting thing about focusing on the virtues is it's different from uh, focusing on rules. It's different from focusing on rules. It's not the same as don't kill or honor your father and your mother. The virtues are about, and here's kind of where we move into the second stage of my small argument. It's about becoming a kind of person. It's about choosing to change yourself in a certain way. Now Aristotle thinks that often this process must begin in early childhood. And in fact, he's a bit of a pessimist about the desire to change ourselves, say by the time that, even, even at your age, even in their 20s. He says usually by the time that people are adults, he says, uh, it's the, pro the project of formation is over. I'm not so sure about that, but I see what he has in mind because this process of acquiring capacities and traits has to do with what you take pleasure in and what pains you, what you're ashamed of, what you enjoy. Okay, with me so far? Okay, with me so far. Now let me slip an additional kind of concept into this mix. And it's someone who now, I'm not dealing with an ancient Greek anymore. This is somebody called Simone Weil, who wrote in the mid 20th century. Has anyone ever heard of her? Alas. Well, you have something to do now. You can go off and read her. Simone Weil, French Jew, she died in 1943 at the unbelievably young age of 34, right? And her work has haunted everyone who comes after her because her voice was so original and so powerful. So she writes this odd and interesting and infuriating little essay that I want to just mention to you. Even the title will tell you a good deal about the kind of temperament you're dealing with. Uh, it's on the right use of school studies with a view to the love of God. Where are we? I mean, what? Is, what? You know, on the right use of school studies with a view to the love of God. And here is her extraordinary claim that school studies, here we go to the liberal arts, here we go, that education can be a process of developing the capacity for attention. Attention. And uh, I mean that just as non-technically as, as it sounds. And that, the development of that capacity for her is, as she says, the substance of prayer. More than that, that is to say the, the purest form of directedness to God is honed with the capacity for attention. And she says, school studies, can you believe she says something like this? School studies, education, anything that you fix your mind on and forget yourself about, that that can hone our capacities to be directed to God. But more than that, she says there's a kind of second attribute to attention, and that is that same capacity for attention is what empathy substantially is. That is what it means to show compassion to others. All right? Extraordinary. 
So we have with Simone Weil the offering of a kind of, I don't know what you'd want to call it, a meta virtue, an ultimate virtue that says we have to become the kinds of people who can give ourselves, as she says, it's a kind of negative effort in attention. And that that capacity or skill, if you prefer, is translatable not only in terms of prayer, but translatable to our interactions with others. And can I just read a short passage? You know me, I, I don't like to go too far from the text. So uh, if you'll just allow me. So here is, she's a, a philosopher of extremes. She just sort of throws her cards on the table and would not be surprised to have argument. <laughs> right. So, not only does the love of God have attention for its substance, the love of our neighbor, which we know to be the same love, is made of this same substance. The capacity to give one's attention to a sufferer is a very rare and difficult thing. It's almost a miracle. It is a miracle. She's not an optimist about human nature. Nearly all those who think they have this capacity do not possess it. Warmth of heart, impulsiveness, pity are not enough. So let me just finish out this paragraph. The love of our neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say to him, what are you going through? It is a recognition that the sufferer exists not only as a unit in a collection or a specimen from the social category labeled unfortunate, but as a man exactly like us who was one day stamped with a special mark by affliction. For this reason, it is enough, but it is indispensable to know how to look at him in a certain way. This way of looking is first of all attentive. Right. Extraordinary claim. An extraordinary claim. So I see Simone Weil as in a way completing an arc of thinking about the virtues and I think it's a helpful arc. It is, the virtues are not only about acquiring certain capacities, uh, wonderful capacities, wholly desirable capacities, but it's about um, attaining a capacity of inner life that changes who you are and makes you able, as she says, frankly, to love at all. And she doesn't think, we can disagree with her, that that love comes naturally to human beings. We, we could disagree about that with me so far. So Simone Weil's claim is that education, fundamentally education's great value, is in giving us access or training in the virtues. And you might say, well, well, we'll see. Do you learn kindness? Do you learn patience? Do you learn justice? Do you learn generosity in your classes? Woo, that would be grading us. <laughs> the ultimate goal of education is the capacity to forget your grades. <laughs> right? Forget your careers. That's not what she's thinking about when she's thinking about education and what she might have termed the liberal arts. Right. But it's about acquiring the capacity of giving one's attention. And that involves knowing what you need to learn. It isn't about, uh, as I said, career goals or grades, simply. It's about the process of attaining a certain kind of inner life. With me so far? Okay. So far so good. Questions so far? Yeah? No? No questions? Hmm. Yes. Yes, please. Jean. Um, so, so how, um, mm. I was just kind of, when we were talking about like how you would kind of like implement these things and like through like example or through practice, I'm just kind of wondering about how Aristotle thought about defining these terms because I think that they mean different things to each person and so is he kind of talking about like there is one definition and he gave that definition or is it just... It's up to like the it's a great question. It's a great out. question. It's a great question. Um, where he wants to assign them is, a, is it's, again, because there's not a rule, it's also not an action. Uh, for, I'll take courage, for example. Let me just do courage. What he wants to use as a definition for courage is to assign it a province of application, right? So for him, 
and, and he works this out for all the ones he mentions. Uh, it's about what makes us afraid and about how we respond to that fear or threat. Do you follow me? So courage, for example, the paradigmatic example would be on the battlefield, soldiers. If you have soldiers who don't have courage, good luck winning that war, right? Because they're gone. They're gone. They're not going to be on the battlefield. They're not going to be able to execute orders, etc. Some people have commitments, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, that's the way in which he first wants to define each virtue, is to give them a kind of area of application or field of... Uh, uh, expression. So courage would be about fear. Uh, justice is interesting because it's not so much about governing our feelings or responses. Justice is going to be about our expressions, our transactions. It's going to be a, particularly about actions. Um, he doesn't talk about compassion or uh, kindness so much. Those aren't big virtues for him. Um, Self-control would be another one. What sometimes you might call moderation. And that's going to be about our feelings of pleasure and pain. And again, if you don't have a certain way of governing that, um, that's going to be tricky in terms of attaining uh, flourishing or eudaimonia. Now, here's what's interesting about all of the virtues. How do we know when we're being virtuous? <laughs> when we're able to attain in practice the good that our judgment is aiming for. So in each case of being just or courageous or being uh, kind or being honest, however we want to think about that, we have to have in practice practical wisdom in order to really express in practice what the virtue is. Can I give you just one little tiny example? I know I'm over, yeah. <laughs> over answering. I apologize. Uh, courage on the battlefield. You might say, oh, well, I've heard of these cases, and there, you can read these cases where someone's throwing a grenade, or, or a grenade has been thrown into the foxhole. And there are such cases in wartime. And uh, the soldier who's also in the foxhole with his buddies, he sees the grenade. And there's, a, you know, a second, two seconds, and it's over, right? Throws himself on it, right? Extraordinary, extraordinary act of heroic courage. Who could say otherwise, right? He gives his life to protect his comrades, his colleagues, right? But imagine if this were in a case where it's practice and you're not in a foxhole and you can just leave, right? That wouldn't be heroic virtue. It would be, I don't know, suicidal. I mean, so the same action, depending on the context, um, is, is not courage. In, in another context, it was the highest expression of courage. Do you follow me? So you're, it, you can't just find a, like a rule or a particular action and say, oh, that's kind or that's, you've always got to have this judgment and what the judgment allows us to do is to look at the context and to see what do we need? What do we need here and now, right? With me so far? Okay, sorry. So can I just finish out one little part of Aristotle just because it's so much fun? Okay, so, uh, Eudaimonia is not an end goal like going to Kentucky for spring break or something. Well, who would want to do that? You know, I mean, uh, sorry for all Kentuckians, and I'm on film. Uh, so it's, like not, it's not like, you know, going to, you know, the beach for spring break. It is uh, what we enact when we attain all of these virtues. It is our being itself. So it's not extrinsic to the life of the virtues. This is an inter interesting distinction. It's internal to it. So you can't like go around the virtues and attain flourishing another way. <laughs> That's another way to put it. They're inseparable. There's another component to Ar for Aristotle to the life of flourishing. And that component is what you might just call luck. There are things that we need in this life that we can't choose for ourselves. Uh, health, certain kind of financial stability, friends, huh, family, right? I mean, things that you need, really, that can help you develop, that can help you enjoy life, and that can even help you in the expression of the virtues. Um, he's got this discussion where basically, uh, I think this is true, I mean, if you don't have money, how can you be a philanthropist, 
right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a potential philanthropist, but, but you have to have something in order to give it away. With me so far? So that's an interesting claim by itself because it says that what we're aiming for in life <laughs> is something that we cannot wholly choose. And you can have very, and do, I just think this is true and also remarkably honest in a philosopher to say this out loud, that there are many people who are deserving of flourishing or deserving of happiness, right, who don't get it because they don't have the luck. They don't have the good things that might enhance their lives. He's not saying, therefore, they're miserable. He's not saying, oh, then the virtues are no good. This is where the virtues then go on and have an extra kind of role, an extra necessity. He says that, in fact, what the virtues give us is a way to endure and persevere through adversity. And without it, without the virtues, adversity ruins you. Right? There's no way. That's an interesting claim to me. Right? And it also, for me, connects back to the role of attention and education in the moral life. Because one of the claims that I would want to make is forget grades, forget career, but this is what I always love about teaching and about engaging in the educational journey, quest, right? Is that hopefully we can sustain our inner lives with what we learn and what we continue to learn within the liberal arts as a lifelong process and that this can in fact illuminate our lives go back to Aristotle and luck even at times in which other things may be difficult that is the in our inner lives becoming a certain kind of self right can in fact give us capacities for perseverance here's the last part of my talk resilience right critique, right, that m helps us to exceed and overcome things that we can't control. Are you with me so far? Okay. So can I just say just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit about that? What, where are we at time? Oh, I'm already, we're all right? Okay, do you want to stand up for a second? Yeah, yeah, let's stand up for a second. Okay, yeah, I just like that. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can ask any kind of question. So what, it, like, more like technical, I guess, what exactly does Aristotle, like, does it's he good. call it luck? Or, did, like, what exactly kind of words did, does he use for that? Well, he uses tuche, which is the Greek for fortune. Okay. You know, luck. Okay. I mean, it, uh, I, he doesn't usually use really technical words. He just wants to refine whatever the concepts are in the language. So. It's just luck. Okay. And luck would be all kinds of things. It's all the things that are life enhancing. Who wouldn't want to be beautiful and wealthy and healthy with lots of friends and a great family? Who's going to turn that down, right? Uh, but of course, that's not always what people get. So what, the interesting thing about flourishing then for Aristotle, I'll stop soon, is this turns out not to be just a moral issue or what what moderns might call moral oh it's about moral character and being morally flourishing no 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 he just says no no it's it's just flourishing and there are parts to flourishing that aren't moral in the sense of not subject to our control not subject to oh but they didn't deserve it right uh, or they did deserve it so it, it's an interesting strange kind of goal but he thinks Flourishing is really the activation of all of the human capacities and an extraordinary uh, expression of social and intellectual engagement. <sighs> wow, yeah. And of course that, is human life not perfected by health and beauty and wealth and friends? Wealth, I mean not crazy Trump-esque wealth. He's talking about just not having the wolf at the door. Right? And not having to worry about that kind of precarious existence. Right? So, with, does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, Susan Sontag has this great quote 
And it's a word that's haunted me, and that's why I titled this lecture, whatever it is, half lecture, Virtues of Inwardness. And she, in this essay that she writes about growing up in Arizona, um, child of, of uh, I think, immigrant Jewish parents, and growing up uh, reading German literature. This was even during World War II, right? And she's, she talks about the way in which coming into contact with literature that was not about what the war was about, even about uh, even German literature, European literature and philosophy, that that gave her access to a new way of thinking about the world that wasn't about regional boundaries or political conflicts or religious parameters. It was about being able to think for herself and seeing more inclusively what human inquiry and human art and human culture could be about. And here's this wonderful quote. So she's thinking about all of that, that gift that that education was. To have access to literature, world literature, was to escape the prison of national vanity, of philistinism, of compulsory provincialism, of inane schooling, of imperfect destinies and bad luck. Literature was the passport to enter a larger life. That is the zone of freedom. Literature was freedom, especially in a time in which the values of reading and inwardness are so strenuously challenged. Literature is freedom. Right? So for her, and this is where it connects to Simone Weil to me, to my ears, right? To her, for her, the process of education, particularly the process of reading, creates an inner capacity that she names inwardness, right? I don't know what inwardness is. She never says what she means exactly by that name. But here's what I sort of take away from that. It's about acquiring the depth and resources within yourself that you can exceed the context in which you're embedded. Right? It can give you capacities for critique, capacities for resilience, for resistance. Right? Because if we are solely defined by our context, if we're, let me put this colorfully, if we're the victims of where we came from, Sorry, Aristotle. Not just how we're formed, but also how we exceed how we're formed. Right? That capacity for inwardness is, to me, ex essential for robust and mature ethical formation. Wow, could you make a longer sentence? Right. You need inwardness to be a fully ethical human being, to me because it's about being able to think for yourself. As she says, it's freedom. It's the passport to being able to go beyond where you are now. All right? You're not simply subject, for good or bad, to what you have now and what you've been taught now. So in that sense, I, I link inwardness to the capacity for attention. All right. Yes, Sasha. Um, what does it mean to be a fully ethical human being? <laughs> like I know. Uh, <laughs> I was like, what does it mean to be a fully ethical human being? <sighs> That's an excellent question. This is why I love philosophy. So I love philosophy. Um, it's always the basic questions that we come back to and drink from like a well. Uh, what is a fully ethical human being? It is someone who has acquired the virtues in such a way that they are in their nature, but more than that, they're able to see and understand, right? not just enact uh, goodness out of a kind of naivete or out of a kind of reflex, but they're really able to appreciate and understand and see the real. I know that it, it sounds very vague even to me, to see the real, to see the good, but surely that's what we're always trying to get better and better at in our lives. Um, Iris Murdoch says, you know, it's, it's not natural for us 
this is someone who studied Faye, um, it's not natural for us to see what's real. We have to practice that. And to me, a fully ethical human being is someone who's able to not only choose the good, but also to intellectually take in more and more of what's actually real in the world. For Sontag, that takes, well, I feel like the machine's about to come get me. Um, <laughs> Uh, for Sontag, that takes a kind of inwardness. It's a capacity to see and to take in attention, but also, I would argue, to, to see and appreciate, right? To respond to beauty, to respond with wonder, is for me, would be components or features of a fully ethical human being. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. No, no, no you've uh, been very patient. <laughs> so is there a temporal component to either moment? So, like, what if your... Um, you do something that you believe is virtuous, right? And um, in the short term, it might have adverse consequences in the world, but in the long term, it's something that can be very virtuous or vice versa. So something that you thought at the time was very virtuous and you see some good that comes out of it immediately, but in the long term, it ends. Can you give me an example? I, I, I feel like, you know, it's like, uh, you, are you gonna bite that hook, Pam? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's like, can you give me an example? Um, I mean, I guess if you're thinking of like, like parenting, right? Like a parent who says, who like spanks their child and they think that it's something that's very virtuous because it gets their child to stop behaving in a particular way at that moment. But in the long term, it can have very aversive consequences. Oh, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful question. Um, again, this is the interesting thing about virtues. Virtues don't um, necessarily uh, designate a particular action, but what they can do is designate actions as out of the question, right? Uh, not so many. Uh, I'm sure Aristotle believed in beating children, but we won't go there. Okay. Um, however, uh, he does say there are a few things that virtuous people would never do, right? They don't murder. They don't steal. Uh, they don't uh, sleep with other men's wives. He's thinking about Greek men here. So, and unfortunately, he, thought, he said that because he thought then adultery is a form of theft. Oh, Aristotle. Um, but there are things that are just ruled out of the question, right? And as we live, I think Aristotle thinks we do get better and better at seeing what is the good. This goes back to Sasha's question. At seeing what is the good and seeing what is needed. Uh, he actually says, um, this is sad for some of us, that the young can't be completely virtuous, that they don't have the experience and the judgment uh, fully in place. So judgment gives us more particulars to begin to sort out individuals. You're with me? So, sorry about that, James. Uh, <laughs> no one's like, you're the exception, man. Uh, yes, Sasha. Um, uh, talking about the person who would steal or something like that, would then it would be virtuous of Aristotle to demonstrate forgiveness, <laughs> kind of forgive him and give him another chance. Oh. Would, what someone does something bad once, is that out of the question for them to be virtuous? Oh no, I, I don't, I'm not thinking he would say that. I think he's thinking, of, if you're thinking about adults, uh, you know, he's not a liberal, or Aristotle. I'm just using his vocabulary. I'm not necessarily endorsing his political views. But I think as an adult, he wants to say that character is pretty hard to shift. And if somebody does something, what he would just simply call base, right? It says, wow, they don't have the virtues, right? Um, he does say, for those of us who are incompletely virtuous, that the proper moral emotion is shame, right? Where you think, oh, oh. That wasn't good. We all do things we cringe at. Um, and then that's a kind of pain response that helps us to remember next time to do it better. To do it better. So he's, he's interesting this way because he's really thought about the emotions as relevant to ethics. It's not just about what you do or what you say. It's also hugely about how you feel. right? And to me that goes back to inwardness actually because being a fully ethical human being, right? Inwardness would be about our, not only our capacity to act well, which I certainly hope it would be, um, and not even just our capacity to know what is the truth about the world and about where we are, but it's about how we feel. Our capacities to respond to beauty, our capacities to respond to uh, 
cultural art, you know, products like plays and music. And that, Sontag's very interested in culture, right? She's wanting to think particularly about the ability to engage in uh, appreciation and understanding of cultural products, art, all right, all, in all of its varieties of expression, is really so important in building a kind of self that helps us to bridge divides that are political or social in nature, to bridge disagreements. It's about being able to attain that kind of distinctiveness. Right? Now, the last kind of cusp of this that I would want to suggest is that, to me, it's about developing a kind of self that is, that possesses inwardness, that, that possesses the virtues that would be, to me, the goals of the moral life, the goals of education as companion to the moral life. But it's also uniquely you, right? That it's also a kind of inward self, a kind of virtuous self that is uniquely you, not only because you're in a different situation than anyone else, but because you, as an individual, is uni you're unique in the history of the universe. It's unrepeatable. It's non-replaceable. Right? It's, to my mind, uh, to use this language, precious. Right? And to me, that is the final challenge of inwardness, which I hope the liberal arts can help us with as well. To me, the liberal arts are under assault uh, in our current climate. And I think the inner life is under assault in our current climate. I mean, the new technologies don't help. right? <laughs> I have so many students who tell me uh, I loved my service trip when I went somewhere and I didn't have to be on my smartphone and I was like, can't you just turn your phone off? <laughs> you know, I mean, he, and, but of course it isn't that easy because we feel this odd compulsion and to me that actually, it exacerbates the pressures upon us uh, that our culture and our society and our desire for career and achievement all of those place upon us. I mean, many of those wouldn't have been news to Aristotle. I mean, he understood various kinds of social pressures and, you know, that's not a new invention. But there are ways in which uh, the new technologies, uh, we invent them to serve us and we end up serving them, right? And the weirdness about this is that it colonizes, uh, forgive me, uh, overstatement, it colonizes consciousness. I mean, it gets in our brains, right? Now, I, I think here's where Aristotle and Simone Weil and Susan Sontag, they're like little angels on my shoulders whispering to me, turn the phone off. Don't check your email, right? The point is to be a kind of self. The point is to have an inner life that is a joy and a companion to you and that sustains you in adversity and in times of happiness and prosperity. That's the point of education. That's the point of the liberal arts. That's the point of life, in my view. Right? It's so hard to, I mean, and we all get caught up in systems, right? We all get caught up in pressures and external goals. And, and for me, again, the part of the, the process of education as a lifelong practice, not as your bachelor's degree, not as your transcript, not as the classes this semester. The point is to be able to ask myself, distancing myself from what I'm doing now. Is this what you want? Is this what you continue to want? A temporal, there's a temporal component to that, right? Um, it's an extraordinary challenge in life is to actually sustain that commitment. It's extraordinary. We're, I, I, there's so many weird parts to being human to me, but one is to, in the midst of constant change, constant change, to always be asking yourself, or trying to, how should I stay the same? When should I change? What should I change to? Right? Extraordinary. The virtues are about, in a certain way, staying the same, but yet they're to be exercised all the time in new contexts, all along the way. Flourishing isn't, oh, that's what I did when I was 52 or 
23, okay, that's off my bucket list, right? Flourishing is the whole life, right? The whole life. And to me, that takes, that requires a certain kind of inwardness. All right, with me so far? Can I just finish out with a couple of quotes? I didn't talk about half of what I planned, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about joy and about love, right? Uh, can I just read you a couple of uh, quotations, if, if I could, just one second. Uh, so let me find my Desert Fathers book. There he is. Uh, okay, so I want to... There's a, has anyone read any of the Desert Fathers before? And this is a, a, a group of early Christian uh, hermits. Oh, and hermitesses, doesn't that sound weird? Uh, men and women who went off to the desert to practice inwardness, to practice a kind of connectedness to God, which they felt needed to be sustained in solitude. And they produced these uh, extraordinary writings. People would go to them. People from the cities would go to them and say, you know, Abba, Father, Papa, you know, give us your teaching. So here's one about becoming, becoming uh, something else. Right. Lot went to Joseph and said, Abba, as far as I can, I keep a moderate rule with a little fasting and prayer and meditation and quiet. And as far as I can, I try to cleanse my heart of evil thoughts. You know, I'm trying to be good. Right. What else should I do? Then the hermit stood up and spread out his hands to heaven. And his fingers shone like ten flames of fire. And he said, if you will, you can become all flame. And I've, I've always been haunted by this saying. It's saying you can burn that brightly, right? But that's not an action, simply. That's not keeping a moderate rule. That's a kind of being. So, I, you know, I, I leave you with this exhortation and this kind of riddle. What does it mean to become all flame and to sustain it as a kind of life project? Right. And that surely has to involve love. Right. Something, a, a love for something beyond ourselves. I'm not talking necessarily about God, but not just about ourselves as the point of it all. Right. About giving ourselves over to some larger project and endeavor. Right. That fuels that kind of passion and ardor in a life. With me so far? Thank you all. All right.